the second last session of real world crypto. This is for threshold cryptography. And we have three talks here. Okay, the, let's see. Okay, the first one is uh, from theory to practice to theory. Lessons learned from multi-partitional signatures. And all three uh, authors, co-authors are on stage. And the talk is, uh, it's uh, Elizabeth and Chelsea and Tim speaks, please. So Schnorr signatures were invented in 1990 by Klaus-Peter Schnorr and were subsequently patented in 1991. In 2001, we see the first multi-party Schnorr scheme by Stenson and Strobel. And then in 2008, the patent for Schnorr signatures expired. Moving ahead to 2018, we see the first three-round multi-party Schnorr schemes. And in 2020, we have two uh, round multi-party Schnorr schemes such as MUSIC2, DWMS, and FROST. In 2021, we introduced FROST2 and an improved proof for FROST. Also in 2021, um, they started a FROST CFRG draft and Bitcoin moved away from ECDSA to Schnorr signatures. In uh, August of last year, NIST uh, standardized EDDSA, which is a deterministic version of Schnorr. And earlier this year, NIST put out an initial public call uh, for threshold schemes. So let's first recall what a Schnorr signature looks like. So the signer here, Alice, is going to form her public key as some generator raised to a field element, which is her secret key. And in order to sign a message, she's going to sample some nonce uniformly at random and take the generator raised to this nonce value. Here I'm using multiplicative notation, but this would be an elliptic curve group, so additive is usually common. Again, it's a nonce, so it's a number used only once. You need a fresh nonce for every message that you sign. At this point, you can form the challenge, which is a hash of the public key, the message, and the nonce. And then the signature Z is formed of the nonce plus the challenge times the secret key. So this nonce value blinds the secret key. The verifier can also compute this hash value and then check the uh, verification of the Schnorr signature as follows. So you can see that this is just the same as the equation for Z. Now when I say multi-party Schnorr, what I mean is threshold signatures or multi-signatures. And in a threshold scheme, you have T out of N parties who are jointly signing the message. Usually there is a trusted key generation algorithm, which can be Shamir secret sharing, or you could have a distributed key generation protocol. Multi-signatures, on the other hand, require all N parties to sign, but they have this nice feature in that you can aggregate the public keys, and this allows uh, the signing set to be formed on the fly. Taking a closer look at the signature scheme, uh, looking at the value Z here, we have talked about ways to uh, share the secret key amongst a set of parties. And note that these parties never reconstruct that secret key. But we also need some way to share the nonce amongst the set of signers. Um, no party individually can know the nonce, so they can extract the secret key. So what do we want? We want a multi-party scheme that verifies exactly like standard single-party Schnorr. And in particular, we want the public key to look exactly like a standard single-party Schnorr public key. We also want few signing rounds, and here we'll be looking at two and three round schemes. We note that the scheme by Stinson and Strobel used a distributed key generation protocol to form the nonce, so this added several rounds. We also want reasonable security assumptions, which I'll talk about in a minute, and concurrent security, which is really important in practice, because in practice, it's, an adversary could potentially open multiple signing sessions at once. 
Here's a high-level overview of uh, some of the schemes. So we have the three-round multi-signature schemes like MUSIG, and then the two-round multi-signature schemes such as MUSIG2, DWMS, BD MUSIG. We also have three and two round uh, threshold schemes, so Sparkle, Frost, and Frost 2. And what I want to highlight here is that the two round schemes are proven under the one more discrete logarithm assumption, which is a, strong, a strictly stronger notion than discrete logarithm. So what this means is potentially it's easier to break OMDL than DL, which is a very standard assumption. However, we get a really nice trade off here because the two round schemes are actually essentially non interactive. So the first round can be pre-processed, and then it's essentially one signing round. All of the schemes I show here are concurrently secure. Now, what does that mean? So uh, an adversary could potentially open a number of different signing sessions. Here, I'm just considering one adversarial signer with an honest signer, Alice. So they can open K signing sessions at once. What the adversary can do is they can wait to see Alice's nonces. So Alice outputs her nonces in each session, and then a rushing adversary can wait and output its nonces. This allows the adversary to forge a signature, and these concurrent attacks affected a number of multi-signatures, threshold signatures, and blind signature schemes. So what we need here is some way for the adversary to kind of have to commit to its nonces. This attack relies on the fact that the adversary sees the honest nonces and then can do something clever to form its own nonces. So this gives some background for uh, what we're gonna see is the structure of the two round schemes. So here, uh, MUSIG2, Speedy MUSIG, Frost, and Frost2, they all share a similar structure. So first in the key generation, um, you might have your trusted key generation, distributed key generation, key aggregation, depending on the scheme, but everybody's going to have some share of the overall public key representing the set of end signers. In order to sign, we're now going to use two nonces. So recall for single party Schnorr, we just had the one nonce R, now we're gonna have S as well. So everybody uh, who's participating outputs these two nonces. In round two, they're now going to form this hash, which takes as input the public key that represents all the signers, the message, and the entire list of the nonces for all of the signers involved. So this is what I mean by kind of committing to the nonces. The adversary can't form that concurrent attack because everything is getting hashed. Then the aggregate nonce representing the signing set is the product of R, S raised to this hash value A. This nonlinearity is important because if you just had R to the A, you could just cancel it out. Now everybody forms the uh, hash of the public key, message, and aggregate nonce, which looks exactly like single party schnorr. And then they output their partial signature. So it's ZI, which is the combination of the nonces plus the challenge times the secret key. So everybody outputs these values ZI. And then you can have a combiner. So here I'm representing the combiner and the verifier is the same uh, party because the combiner can be anyone. And basically they just take all of the uh, Z values from all the parties add them up, and then the final signature consists of this aggregate value R and Z. They compute the hash themselves, and we have standard single party Schnorr verification. Now, I talked about concurrent security, but another important aspect of security is adaptive corruption. So usually when threshold schemes are proven, we prove static security. And what this means is that the adversary has to corrupt parties at the beginning of the protocol, and then the signing rounds commence but the stronger adaptive adversary can actually uh, corrupt parties as the protocol progresses. So here, the adversary can corrupt the third party, and then at some point during signing, they can corrupt the second party, Bob here. And this is a really uh, strong notion of security because you have to output that party's secret key, but you also have to output the state of everything that has happened so far. And we were able to show adaptive security of Sparkle, which is our three round threshold signature, and we're also uh, working on the proof for Frost. So now we'll talk about some more practical aspects of our work, and I'll hand it over to Tim. Tim, take it away. Hey, thanks, uh, Liz, for, for the first part. <laughs> um, so um, we've seen uh, all these schemes now, and the, you presented the list of all these schemes, and now if you, if you wanna use those schemes in practice, uh, one of the obvious questions you can ask is, okay, but what of the, which of these schemes should I actually use in practice, right? 
And um, to get an insight here, uh, we have to look at the properties that we expect from a multi-party threshold, uh, from a multi-party Schnorr signature scheme. So the first property we obviously want is unforgeability, which just means that the attacker can't forge signatures. But there's always uh, another property that turns uh, up in some form in your system, which is liveness. So you should also be able to create signatures always. Otherwise, you just lose functionality and you can't make progress in your system. And um, with that in mind, we can ask the uh, question, um, should I use a multi-signature scheme or, sh or should I use a threshold signature scheme in practice? And the first observation we can make here is that uh, multi-signatures do not guarantee liveness. So because it's inherently an N of N setup, um, whenever there is one signer who is malicious or just not available, signing is not possible. So that this looks like multi-signatures are actually not a good idea at all, but this really depends on the setting. For example, in, uh, if in your system where you use your uh, multi-party signature, you have some other layer where you can handle this um, case where you can't make a signature, then it might be totally okay to use multi-six. And the prime example here is um, usually in cryptocurrencies where uh, if you if you want to do advanced functionality, some people call this a smart contract, for example, um, you usually have the case that multiple parties commit their funds to a single output on the blockchain, such that they can only uh, spend the funds if they all agree. And this condition that they all agree is exactly what we can uh, express on a multisig. And um, for example, um, this happens in, in Bitcoin, in the uh, Lightning Network, which is a payment channel network. And a payment channel um, is a channel between two parties where they commit their money, and then they can make faster payments without hitting the, the blockchain. And um, in such a construction, you always anyway need some fallback mechanism if one signer disappears or gets malicious that the other signer is able to get their money back. And because you have this, this uh, fallback mechanism, Anyway, in your system, after some timeout, the other party will get the party uh, will get the, the funds back. It's it's not a problem that you use multi six and you can handle this case just on a different layer of the system. And then um, the advantage is then of course that you can make use of the non-interactive key aggregation and you don't have to resort to um, distributed key generation. But if you don't have this fallback in your system or you just don't want to use it, then um, you need to use a full threshold signature scheme, and then usually what you want to do is run a, a distributed key generation algorithm. And um, one issue is that these DKGs turn out to be cumbersome in, in practice, um, and there are multiple points where um, they can be complicated, but there's just one point we want to highlight here, is, and this is that um, DKGs always require some form of broadcast channel. And often this is kind of very implicit in the protocol descriptions. If you look at the paper, it, there's just a sentence that says, okay, like every, every communication happens over a reliable broadcast channel. And what they actually mean here is consensus or BFT, so very strong requirement. And if you, if you then look at implementations, it seems that they tend to don't understand this or ignore this aspect. Um, so there is certainly also much so something we could do on our side to improve those constructions or maybe give better guideline to, guidelines to implement this. But at the moment, um, this is just a point where people need to be careful. And another, um, another question you can ask now, if you want to use a, a threshold signature scheme, you have to pick those parameters N and T, right? And the good news here is that so Frost and also Frost 2, so whenever I say Frost, I, it applies to both Frost and Frost 2. Frost supports any choice of N and T, but that just makes our problem harder, right? So we have to come up with a choice. Um, and what people did classically is look at honest majority settings. For example, if you have uh, here five signers, just because it fits nicely on the, nicely on the slide, <clears throat> you may want to pick uh, T equals three. And in that case, uh, you can tolerate up to two malicious signers for unforgeability, so that's why it's honest majority, because three of them are left and three of them are honest. And the nice thing in this setting is that this matches the number of tolerable bad signers you can have for liveness. For liveness, when I say bad, this can mean malicious or either offline. But here we really get the same number, so as long as only two nodes are bad, um, we are fine in that case. But that's not the only uh, choice you can make. You can also, oh, and, and yeah, sorry, and the, in some systems, you anyway have some, maybe some consensus mechanism going on that usually requires um, 
yeah, um, honest majority anyway, or even honest super majority. In that case, you have no choice. But if you have a choice, what you can do is you can move to a higher T. Maybe you can set T equals to four. And um, in that case, that means you have more unforgeability now in a sense and less liveness. And in this setting here, for example, you may up, end up in a situation where you have two bad signers which are malicious or don't uh, respond. So you, you could get stuck here but at least you don't get a forgery. So this kind of prefers um, unforgeability over liveness. And this is just a trade-off you have to decide in your application. There's no golden rule here. I think it really depends on the specific requirements of your application. And of course, you could take that to the extreme and set n equal t and basically give up liveness entirely. But then you are, sorry. Ah, there should, <laughs> should have been another comment. So, but then you are in, in a, if you set t equal n, then you are again in the case where you can use multi-signatures. So you probably then want to use multi-signatures and not threshold signatures in the first place. But there, if, uh, if you talk about liveness, there's another thing we should talk about. So if you, if you have just enough honest participants, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can create a signature because if you run the signing protocol, there may be honest and malicious parties in the signing protocol and the malicious parties could try to disrupt the signing protocol and try to prevent the honest signers from getting a signature. And, um, the property that uh, avoids this uh, is called robustness and just means that the signing protocol always succeeds if you have enough honest parties. And the insight here is that uh, Frost itself is not robust. And uh, the reason is you can uh, think of Frost as a protocol where you first have to pick a subset of T signers. And um, if you picked wrong, then, well, the session won't work. So in that case, for example, on the slide here, we have a two of three setup and we pick two signers and one of them is malicious. The malicious signer just sent garbage and then also the protocol which is out, which has output garbage. And the only thing we can do then is actually pick another set and rerun the protocol. So in general to make uh, Frost robust, what you need to do is you have to, in the worst case, you have to uh, start multiple runs of Frost with different subsets. And now um, I was involved in the work uh, uh, called Roast, where we propose a wrapper uh, that just picks those subsets in a very clever way, such that you only need a linear number of Frost sessions, but you still get a protocol which is not only robust, but also asynchronous, so you never run into timeouts, or the adversary actually can never force you into a timeout so that you have a nice uh, small delay when creating signatures. Okay, and now if we look at actual uh, standardization and deployment efforts, um, first of all, uh, when it comes to standardization, I think the uh, most important thing to mention here is that there is an active internet draft uh, in the CFRG about Frost. So there's this ongoing thing, um, but also in, in uh, there are some community efforts for, oh, I again skipped another slide. Ah, so <laughs> uh, in the Zcash uh, ecosystem, um, there is also a proposal, it's currently a draft for a Zcash improvement proposal that uses Frost for wallets. So you can imagine, for example, this being used in, a, um, in, in hardware wallets where you have three hardware wallets and you store them at different places and, and you need two of them to sign and stuff like, like that set up. Um, and also in the in the uh, Bitcoin community, there is a Bitcoin improvement proposal that uh, has just been finalized two days ago. Um, this is about music and not about Frost, so this covers multi-six. And uh, interestingly or ironically, uh, the version that got, got promoted to the final version was release candidate four. So this is RC4. Um, I'm not sure if this is a good omen for, for applied crypto, but uh, let's see. And um, last but not least, um, there's the um, NIST call or a draft of a call currently for multi-party threshold schemes. Um, but if you if you are interested in the details of that, just have a look at uh, the talk by uh, Luis yesterday, who covers all of this in, in great detail. And uh, now looking at actual implementations, uh, both for Frost and Music, we see a lot of projects that are uh, currently implementing um, the algorithms, some of them use them in production already. Uh, some of them have draft implementations are basically just awaiting the finalization of the, standard, of the standards to, to move to production. I think in Frost, the uh, uh, most notable project is, is Zcash. And in the Music 2, uh, from, for Music 2, I think the, the most notable project is, the, is one implementation of the Lightning uh, net payment network that I mentioned earlier that already uses Music 2. Uh, 
V version of it in, uh, in production and will now move to the final standard. Okay, and um, the, the main thing I want to convey with this slide is just that this stuff is being used in practice, but uh, practice is not everything, so there's still open problems that we need to solve in theory, and uh, I will hand over to Chelsea, who will cover that part. All right, so now um, we're gonna look at a range of open research problems that have been motivated by the use of these schemes in practice. So the first uh, problem I want to pose to you, uh, the first open research problem is that of creating efficient deterministic signatures. So as Liz mentioned before, um, we have EDDSA, which is a variant of Schnorr, but most importantly, it's deterministic. So, in EDDSA, it's very similar, but the nonce is generated by the hash of the message and the secret key. Uh, and the reason why we do this is to help prevent issues arising from bad randomness. So for example, if a machine were to go down and come back up, um, you would be able to seed the nonce using uh, randomness from the secret key. And then the rest of EDDSA is, is very similar to Schnorr. So, I'm going to stress a very important point. And if you come away with something from the talk, it is, well, hopefully you come away with a lot of things, but hopefully it's this. Uh, if you were to use that technique for EDDSA style determinism in the two and three round schemes we mentioned before, this would not be secure. And I've had people come and talk to me about, can we do this and other discussions? So the answer is no, <laughs> we can't do this. So um, if you need a deterministic multi-party Schnorr scheme, they exist. They're less efficient and they're more complex. But if you need that today, um, please look at these schemes. Please don't take that technique and apply it directly to the schemes that we just talked about. I'm going to show you this attack just in a little bit more detail because it's interesting. Um, because it's interesting and also to sort of drive that point home. So I'm going to show you um, a very simple multi-party signature. This is insecure in other ways, so also don't use this, but it's going to help simplify this message of why you don't, you don't want to do this uh, technique. So this attack is going to happen in exactly two signing rounds. So this starts by the corrupted party sending a message, the honest party deriving their nonce, um, as in EDDSA, via the hash and the secret key. They derive their commitment, they send their commitment to the corrupt party. And in this first signing session, the corrupt party follows the protocol honestly. So they derive their nonce and their commitment, they send it back to the honest party. And then the honest party derives the group commitment as just the product of both commitments, the challenge, and their response. And they send the response back to the corrupt party. Things get interesting in the second signing session. So in the second signing session, the corrupt party again sends the same message to the honest party. The honest party again follows the protocol. They derive their nonce honestly. They derive their commitment honestly. They send it back to the corrupt party. And then here, the, the corrupt party uh, deviates from the protocol. So here, they sample their nonce uniformly at random, or they do whatever. They sample their nonce somehow. And then they generate their commitment following the protocol. They send this different commitment back to the honest party, who then derives the group commitment again following the protocol. Then they derive the challenge and the response. And they send this back to the corrupt party. So here, the corrupt party does not follow the protocol, but the honest party can't detect that. So to the honest party, everything looks fine. They look, it looks like the corrupt party is following the protocol. But importantly, in the second uh, session, the group commitment, the challenge, and the response for the honest party are different from the first signing session. And you might see where this is going, but if you don't, this results exactly in a secret key recovery attack. So um, this is essentially a nonce reuse attack. And you're dead. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, don't do this. Uh, and but then we do have a, a question here, which is, okay, we do have deterministic style schemes, which allows the honest party to detect when the corrupt party deviates from the protocol, but they're not very efficient. And so the question is, can we build a real world or efficient deterministic threshold scheme that solves this problem? All right, the next research question I'm gonna to pose to you is looking at the trade-off between efficiency and security assumptions for signing. So Liz before presented 
um, a host of these two and, round, two and three round schemes that exist. And they really fall into the, the categories of three round schemes reducing to standard assumptions and two round schemes reducing to one more discrete log. And so the question we have here is, is there an impossibility result here? So can we actually prove that these two round schemes require stronger assumptions? Or is it, does an impossibility result not exist, which means that maybe we could get two round schemes with, um, with standard assumptions? So this would be useful to, to investigate and to prove more formally. The final research question I'm going to pose to you is along similar lines. So it's looking again at this trade-off between efficiency and the security assumptions. But here I'm going to talk about specifically with respect to key generation. So before, um, both Liz and Tim talked about DKGs. And I'm going to introduce them a little bit more formally, but still at a high level. So what a DKG is, is it's a multi-party, uh, at a high level, it's a multi-party computation where all of the parties communicate and work with each other, and then at the end, everyone has a secret share with respect to the secret key. And the public key is also output that represents the group. And what's important in these types of protocols is that no single party knows the corresponding secret key. So at the end, everyone is able to work together to generate these secret shares, but no one knows the secret key uh, alone. And so everyone's essentially trusted similarly. There's two ways you can prove the security of DKGs, or two main ways. So the first way is to prove the security of the DKG in the context of some other scheme. So for example, in Frost, we introduce a two-round DKG, and we prove its security when we are proving the unforgeability of Frost. So what we said is that this uh, two-round DKG is secure in the context of Frost. Another way that you can prove the security of a DKG is independently. And this is essentially by a proof of composability. And what this means is what you're saying is any setting that uh, some idealized function is secure for, you can then use the DKG as well. This might sound a little confusing, so what do I mean by that? So here we have some target key generation scheme. It's a single party scheme. Magic happens internally to it, and it outputs a secret key and a public key. Then we have a DKG, and stuff happens inside of it as well, and it also outputs a secret key and public key. And so when we prove the composability of a DKG, what we're saying is that in the setting where this target key gen is secure, this DKG is also secure. And this is a very nice thing, because then essentially you have a DKG, which is secure across um, potentially many schemes. Oops. But then obviously um, what's nice is that here in the DKG setting, the secret key is actually secret shared, and so no one actually knows it. So similarly to the setting that we saw before, these two and three round uh, signing schemes, we have the same kind of breakdown in two and three round schemes for distributed key generation. So here I'm talking about distributed key generation specifically for the EDDSA or Schnorr uh, setting. There's also DKGs for ECDSA. Um, as well, but here I'm focusing specifically on schemes that have been proven secure in the context of Schnorr and EDDSA. So um, some, some of the ones that I wanna highlight is there's one uh, by Gennaro et al, and it was output, it was published in the 90s, so it's been around for a long time. And then another TKG that recently came out by myself, Ian Goldberg and Douglas Debla, is called Storm. And these schemes reduce to standard assumptions in three rounds. But then we also have two round schemes. So there's PEDPOP, um, which we introduced in the paper for Frost, and then we proved later in a Crypto 22 paper. And um, PEDPOP is secure in the context of Frost, but PEDPOP does require stronger assumptions. So the question we have here is, again, similarly, do, is there an impossibility result here? So are there two round schemes which we can have um, proofs of composability for? And then potentially, can we have uh, weaker assumptions for these DKGs? So we've talked a lot uh, in this talk. There's been a lot of different things we've gone over, and hopefully you have a better sense of the field now and where things are going and some of the open problems that exist. So what are some of the main takeaways from all of this? First, uh, Schnorr multi-party signatures are being used in practice today, and that's something we're really excited about, and it's really cool to see these schemes being used and deployed and the lessons that are being learned. So this is something we're, we're pretty excited about. However, there are a lot of questions and challenges that remain to, proving, to improving their usability and security. 
this is something we all, the three of us, are working actively on. And if you have ideas or you'd like to collaborate, please come and talk to us. We would love to work with you. And T of N of us will be involved in the NIST call. T is to be determined. So <laughs> please let us know if you'd like to join forces and work with us as well. Um, also, Liz is on the job market and she's excellent to work with. So please talk to her and hire her. She's amazing. <laughs> And that's all. So maybe we have some time for questions. Shai. Just a, sorry, a pedantic uh, comment. What you call concurrent security is not the same notion as what we talk about in concurrent zero knowledge and things. The reason is because you, you ha the, the solu your solution has this hash of all the uh, messages, which means that you need to know about all the other concurrent things. I think if you look in Odette Goldar's book, it's called Parallel Security. So, you know, I don't know if the, if the genie is out of the bottle yet, but if, it, if it's still possible to rescind that term and use the sort of the, the more common one, it would be better. Um, we did not come up with that term, but yeah, that's yeah. good to know. <laughs> and, and the other thing is that deterministic is obviously uh, sort of Resettably secure. I mean, this is the context, you know, the context that you want to be. A really, really nice talk. So you raised a lot of interesting open questions, but uh, I wonder that there are some existing solutions, for example, like deterministic low round uh, threshold signature that comes into mind is BLS. You, what's your take on that? And uh, then you mentioned the DKG, you know, some uh, non-interactive DKG. I mean, there are some works out there doing this public key encryption plus zero knowledge proof kind of work. So these two questions. Uh, yeah, threshold BLS is great and you should use it if you can. Um, but do you, do you also want to talk So about how this? does it, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you have a comparison with your work? Like how does it compare like any pros and cons compared to these directions? Um, I think just one, one more comment about BLS maybe it's, um, it's, it's always interesting because it, it really like the one of the feature of those schemes is that you can use them as a drop in replacement for existing deployments or you can even for new deployments you can maybe decide to specify a Schnorr style signature because it's uh, more efficient in a single uh, signer case and still make use of those protocols of course if you if you can design your uh, system from scratch and you um, you, you want to use BLS, then that, that, that's a good idea. There's always this, this joke that, I mean, I, I now complain about, in a sense, about the ECDSA threshold work because I say, okay, just switch to Snore, and then there's always so some other people that tell me, okay, but just switch to BLS. And, yeah, I guess they're right. Yeah. So they do exist, but, you know, that has some other disadvantage. Okay, that's good. Okay, yeah. thank you. And do you have anything about that DKG? Like, uh, uh, there is this DKG by James Groth that's been out there for a while, uh, non interactive. Um, as I understand, it's defined in the context of pairings, but... Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I think there's work to be done to define it not in the context okay. of pairings. Okay. Um, I also specifically have DKGs that are not publicly verifiable. So yeah, there's a whole host, but I'm, I just put up DKGs that are three round um, that don't require more complicated cryptography like public verifiability. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, I have a question about uh, security. Uh, you mentioned you have underway uh, an effort to prove adaptive security for the two round. Yeah. Is that something you have on the horizon or you have no idea how to achieve it? Yeah, so um, we put out like an e-print, I don't know, yesterday for Sparkle. So this is the three round scheme. Um, I will note that in order to prove adaptive security there, you actually give the message and the signing set in the first round. So it is fully three rounds. And you need that for not statics and forgeability, which is the usual notion, but you need it for adaptive. For Frost, we do not suspect that you actually need the message and signing set in the, in the first round, so it can maintain the pre-processing plus one signing. Okay. And is all of this in the setting of uh, uh, regular enforgeability rather than strong enforgeability? Yeah, it's in the setting of enforgeability, though I think it could be extended to strong enforgeability. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Dmitry Kovatovich. Uh, very interesting talk, thanks. And uh, yeah, from the perspective of a person who audits third party code a lot, I like to yeah, draw attention to two interesting things. So first of all, this composability thing that you mentioned, it's really, really important because people are still using 
uh, in combination of their kind of their building their threshold schemes, but they often use some DKGs from 90s and, and something like this. And they often don't know how to properly combine them and what security properties are still, the, are still here and what are not and, and, and so on. The second thing, I think the deterministic part is very, very important because nowadays with this kind of widespread of blockchain code and so on, people kind of for some reason stopped using very reliable crypto libraries. They start again using uh, weird and very insecure random number generators. Uh, for, for testing, for example, they, they first use it like uh, Merson Twister for, 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 for testing and then it goes into production. That happens very, very often nowadays. Um, and yeah, if we have some scheme which is deterministic and get, get rid of this, I think this would be very, very uh, helpful in stopping this sort of bugs widespread. So yeah, thank you for this efforts. Okay, so uh, let's thank the speakers again. Okay, so I'll move on to the second talk. Threshold ECDSA towards deployment. Now, uh, Abby will be a speaker. Hello. All right. Thank you very much, uh, committee, for inviting me here. Uh, this is my daughter's first crypto conference. She's currently interested. She's currently interested in social studies and large language models, but I'm trying to convince her to take a career in security. All right, so this, uh, this works uh, on, on our work on Threshold ECDSA, and it's uh, with Jack and Yash and Isa, and I'll be the speaker. And uh, thank you very much to the previous set of speakers, Elizabeth and co, uh, for explaining what threshold signatures are. So I will skip the slide where I explain what exactly a threshold signature is. Uh, the one thing I will add to their definition is what the security notion is, the security model. So in this work, the protocols we're talking about are N-1 secure, which means that it tolerates all but one. If there's one honest party, then essentially the protocol will work. Uh, um, and, sorry? Oh, okay, great. Uh, there's also other notions, N over two, so there are many protocols for this threshold ECDSA in this other model where you assume that at least a uh, half of the participants are uh, honest majority and things become a little bit easier in that model. Okay, so as the previous uh, speakers talked about, uh, Schnorr signatures have this very nice feature, which is that uh, the yellow part is very easy. It's sort of a linear operation there. And the signature part S right there is also a linear operation in the secret key uh, and the nonce K, all right? Uh, ECDSA starts out, well, it has that same sort of structure at the beginning. Uh, but then it becomes a little bit odd here. S is much different here. It's nonlinear. You see it has a division of K there. Uh, it has a secret key operation and a multiplication by Rx. And in particular, this is a very odd thing because Rx is a point. It's in the elliptic curve point. So it's in sort of the base field of the elliptic curve, uh, whereas you're using it uh, in a field where you're in, in the uh, sort of order field, the scalar field. So there's a, there's a bunch of things going on here, and it, it was done in order to basically uh, circumvent some sort of patent. That's unfortunate, but in fact, the world has adopted this, and this is why we study this question of threshold ECDSA. Now, as they also mentioned that EDDSA has this uh, similar linear structure on S, but in, in fact, a problem here with, uh, with, with how they pick the knots. And so here are all the complexities for this elliptic curve type of problems. We'll talk about the middle one here today and how to deal with that weird equation right there in the red. So let's look at it a little bit closer. So this red part right here, secret key is going to be in a threshold setting. It's going to be shared among all the parties. Uh, and the K value here is going to also be selected by all of the parties. If you give one party a choice of that K, then obviously you can use this nonce re-attacks that uh, our previous speakers uh, talked about, and that would make the scheme insecure. So you have this problem of how do you compute SK is shared among parties, K is shared among parties. How do you compute this particular uh, type of equation? And we proposed a few ways of doing this uh, in this n minus one security model. There are many other works in this area. And so let me try to categorize and group these. So the gray ones, they rely on an additive homomorphic encryption scheme that uses a different complexity assumption like pi a or class groups. And 
In my opinion, I don't think we should be designing elliptic curve signatures that need assumptions like RSA and so forth. So that's why, uh, or, or, or other even more esoteric assumptions, that's why I put those gray out. The blue protocols here uh, are actually interesting. I'm gonna talk about them in a second. And they, they attempt to use generic MPC techniques and sort of refine them for the particular case that we're talking about. And this last one on the red here, I'm gonna talk about that, uh, this latest work by uh, Zhu et al. Uh, I'm also gonna sort of mention that. So why do I like this type of, uh, why do I like OT-based protocols in this particular thing, the, the advantage of our particular approach here? So all of the gray ones here that rely on additive homomorphic encryption, it's a very conceptually elegant way of doing this because you, with additive homomorphic encryption, you can do this multiplication and this inversion in a very clever way, very simple, elegant way. But the price that you pay for that is that you have to add these extra assumptions, which maybe you have some sort of ethical or philosophical problem with that, like uh, you know, global warming and, and also using EC, you know, PIA when you're doing ECDSA could be a problem. Uh, heavy computation is the big practical problem. And now you're doing uh, elliptic curves were meant to do operations on 256 bits, and now all of a sudden you're doing operations on four or 5,000 bit uh, integers and so forth. And they also seem to require these very, very tricky zero knowledge proofs in the middle of the protocol. And if you try to skip them, you get into trouble. So that's, that's the problem there. Now, Nigel and his student, they had a very clever way of uh, handling this and many other type of classes of problems. So they came up with MPC that has the specific form that for, for computing functions like this. And let me explain what that is. So F, let F be in any algebraic computation with over X and X inverse. And the output of your MPC has to be G to this F value. So that's the class of MPC problems that they handle. And they came up with a very elegant idea using speeds, max in the exponents, very elegant way. Uh, but the way we look at this is uh, fundamentally it incurs a 2x overhead because you're macking every algebraic operation you do in F. And you also, when we actually sit and count the rounds, we actually counted 13 extra rounds to deal with this statistical mac. So now let me get to the punch point, the motivation behind all of this talk right here. Our family of protocols has the following set of advantages. First, we relax the statistical mac to a computational mac. And second of all, this is really the key insight which is that we realized that in the computation of this signature, we actually, the, uh, some intermediate value in that computation actually operates like a Mac. So you don't have to do any extra work in order to do this type of Mac. That's really the, the, the key inside of this, this class, this, this line of work. And that results in a faster protocol with fewer rounds. Now, obviously we implemented this and we evaluated it, but it's better when I can show you evaluations that other people did. So for example, Danvers et al, let me apologize here to Marcel Keller, I've misspelled his name there, the C should be a K. They reevaluated they re a number of threshold ECDSA schemes, and I'll point you to the yellow one there, that's our line. And I'll also ask you to do the math, you can sort of see that our protocols are on the order of 10 to 100 times faster than some of the other protocols in that area. Very good. Now there's another protocol, Zhu et al. They followed up on our line of thinking about how to approach this problem. They also re-implemented and evaluated a number of different protocols, uh, specifically ones that use the PIA approaches, ones that use ECPIA, and ones that use class groups and so forth. Again, you can sort of see the bottom two lines. Our protocols are actually uh, 10 to 100x more efficient. Now the very interesting point is that their protocol, that very last line, is about 3.3 milliseconds faster than us. And they figured out this very clever insight that reduces the number of multiplications you need to do. This is only for the two out of two case. From two multiplications, our protocol, to, to one multiplication. We think that's a very interesting idea, but for us to get our security proof to work, it took, look, took a lot of subtle uh, sort of work to get our security proof working. And we have not been able to evaluate their results and, uh, and convince ourselves that it works in the security way. So, they save one multiplication, they gain 0.3 milliseconds, but they lose a little bit uh, of uh, verifiability, at least from our work. And we're looking forward to seeing a final version of their security proof. Okay, so that's the end of my motivation, my rant for why I think this is an important area and why this line of work is the, uh, the, the one to focus on. Let me talk about the learnings that I had in trying to build this and deploy this. Before I can do that, uh, of course, there's one important uh, little measure here. So. I'm going to talk about the rest of the talk for two out of two and k out of k, which is not necessarily a threshold, right? You have to have two out of n. Uh, but just to say that this is the hardest version of the problem, two out of two or k out of k, because there is this nice guy, 
a uh, nice handsome guy named Lagrange. He has a very nice idea there. If you know this idea, it's great. If you don't look on the Wikipedia page there, you just need a multiplier uh, in order to reduce the two out of n case or the k out of n case to the two out of two or the k out of k case. You just use this trick. You just use a local operation and then you can just use one of those protocols above. Okay, so now my six learnings from this area. Okay, so these are the improvements that we've discovered while implementing and helping other teams. And this is a long list of people who we wanna thank for giving us a great feedback on how to improve our work. First point, from our 2018 paper, this was the form of our protocol. And forget about the details, just look at the direction of the arrows. It's actually a two round protocol. Bob sends a bunch of messages to Alice, including the multiplier, the OT multiplier that we use. And then Alice sends a response back and Bob can reconstruct the signature. This, uh, if we think about the talk from Monday, Apple, they gave us a very good reason for picking a protocol like this. We wanted this message structure, the one round message structure for achieving this type of thing. But it has a natural problem, which is that in this case, there is always a bias to the nonce. You cannot avoid that. Uh, and the way, we, the way that shows up in the proof is that when we identify our ideal functionality, we have this little blue section right here, which formally defines the way in which Alice can bias the nonce that's used in the signature. Now, it's obviously not a bias in which Alice can pick any nonce that she wants that would be insecure. There's this uh, nice little trick that we use in the random oracle model, which uh, basically allows Alice to grind. So she can push a button, get a nonce, look at it, and if she doesn't like it, throw it away and push another button. She can push that button polynomial number of times because she's poly time bounded. And then when she gets one she likes, she can continue the protocol. Uh, that is a bias that we show does not affect the security of the protocol in the generic group model. But Yuda Lindell, he called us out on this. He said, you know what, this is an extra, you know, cognitive overhead that you have to think about. And, you know, does people, does this work in the application that you want? He said, really, we want clean functionalities. He wants functionalities that look just like this, where line 12, it's just what the ideal functionality is doing is computing exactly the, uh, you know, the standard notion of that signature. So we can update our protocol to do that, and we have. Of course, it just requires, for cryptographers, it just requires one commitment in the first line of the protocol. And so our new protocol is like this. It takes three messages. But what we realized is that actually this, this comes for free because when you're running a threshold signature and you need to sign multiple particular messages, you can move the first message and pipeline it with the very last message of the last protocol. And normally you wouldn't want to do this in a cryptographic protocol because you have to keep state. But in a threshold key setting scenario, everybody's keeping state already. They're keeping their threshold key and they're keeping all sorts of other state information already. So we just add this first round to the last message and we get back a protocol that like Apple likes, which is basically Bob Dallas and Alice to Bob. So this was, thank you though for pushing us to do this. Second one, key refresh. In real life, you need to be able to refresh your key. What does that mean? That means that this group of parties has some key for a particular public key. They want to push a re refresh button, and each of them wants to get a new key for the same public key. And it turns out my student, Yash, and co his co-authors figured out how to do this very, very efficiently for our particular protocol. So he used these set of ideas, and when he benchmarked it for our two out of n case, it actually added one millisecond to do this refresh. Every time you sign, you. The, the parties refresh. Now that assumes that all of the end parties are online, but even if you don't do that, whenever the on parties are online, it adds one second to the overall protocol. One millisecond, sorry. Roughly 20% of, uh, of the time of our protocol. Great. But this really only works when you can refresh the key very efficiently for the k out of n case. So for example, in a PIA uh, setting, it's really, really hard to re-randomize the n that you use when you set up uh, a threshold key that's based on this PIA thing. It's really hard to re-randomize an RSA modulus, right? You have to just come up with a new one, and that means a whole new key setup, and in that world, it basically takes seconds to refresh. Okay, third thing is performance. So this was a table of performance for number of parties of going from five to 128 in uh, 2019. And you can sort of see, take any particular line, look at the one case when we're running in one particular GCP zone. And uh, that's basically roughly the compute bound uh, aspect of the protocol using LAN, which is you know, inside a data center is very fast. And the five or 16 zone ones basically reflect the overhead of actually communicating across a continent or across the world. And the reason for this basically slowdown was that we picked a protocol that had log T where T was the threshold plus six rounds for this. And at the time we had a 10 round protocol that was also constant round. 
Uh, but because we realized that this was kind of a bottleneck, we've come up with a new version, a five round protocol. It doesn't have any zero knowledge proofs. It really uses this trick that I mentioned about macking and so forth and the random Oracle model tricks. There are no hidden fees. It's not hiding rounds in pre-processing or offline or anything like this. This is the protocol. And all of the operations are symmetric operations for signing. You need 13 elliptic curve operations to verify some of the checks, but most of it is all AES or SHA, which can be very, very fast on mobile processors. Okay, number four, uh, and this we want to give Lance Roy and Ben Riva some credit for this. So Lance Roy showed, so our protocol uses an OT extension. In our academic implementation, we used a particular OT extension, this KOS extension, and Lance showed an attack against that KOS extension for a particular uh, set of parameters. Now those parameters don't apply to our implementation, or sorry, to, to our use of KOS, so our implementation wasn't vulnerable, uh, but it did identify a gap in the KOS proof, and so we're moving to soft-spoken. A more interesting uh, observation, Ben Riva showed, and this was a pure systems level fault in our academic implementation. So when you run many sub protocols, and one, let's so at one point you run 128 of these OT extension protocols, if one of them fails, the program should basically filter that failure all the way up to the top. And we weren't handling that case uh, properly. And so Ben Riva pointed that and we, and we fixed it out. Very, very little clever observation that he made. Okay, the more interesting things that we've learned are basically the gaps between theory and practice. And these are three of those, these that I wanna basically cover. The first one is a very standard one. We've seen a lot of bug bounties recently about improper use of the Fiat Shamir transform where you don't include the context. If you write a full security proof where this issue comes up is that in a programmable random Oracle model, you have to assume that every sub protocol uses its own random Oracle. And that's easy to do if you can basically include some prefix at the beginning of that hash. Now, our academic implementation had about 574 lines that synchronized this selection of random Oracle tags to make sure each random Oracle was separate. And I basically, I learned TLA plus, which is this amazing thing that Leslie Lamport has done. And I started thinking I could do a better version of this of 574 lines. And I started working my way to this and it came up, it basically led me exactly how Leslie says, which is that if you think about this thing, you come up with a better algorithm. And we found a much simpler way to do this. So thank you, PLA plus people. The elephant in this room is straight line extractability. I'll just let that hang for a while. <laughs> so <clears throat> a protocol that uses zero knowledge proofs in a concurrent setting uh, basically needs to extract witnesses without rewinding. And the Fiat Shamir technique uh, does not let you do this. It does not let you extract witnesses without rewinding. So what you needed to use is a straight line extractable technique and Pass and Mark Fishlin uh, and then myself and, and my student, we came up with different more efficient ways to do this, but they all boil down to running like 10 copies. If you need to do one proof, and you need it to be straight line extractable in the random oracle, then it roughly takes about 10 times running that proof, even if you use very uh, sophisticated techniques. Concurrent means if you are using a threshold setting in web three, or actually in web two, or on the internet, then that means you are in a concurrent setting. And if you're doing this just at home, then maybe you're not in a concurrent setting. But so that's, that's the escape hatch. But for all of these other deployments, this I think is a gap. So, are there concurrent attacks? Are there explicit attacks that use concurrency as a way? Well, the ROS attacks are in fact one type of concurrency attack. And this is an attack that doesn't have an explicit way to break a protocol right now. Uh, you can't break Fiat Shamir this way, but is in fact, you know, as humanity, we should strive for understanding what our theory tells us and our theory tells us to do this. So <clears throat> what it told us is that we should strive to build a protocol that does not need like a Fiat Shamir discrete log proof in the middle of it. And that's what led us to drive us to do this five round protocol where you just use commitments and the multiplier. So we don't have that overhead there. PIA, on the other hand, needs this. These are just four lines of types of proofs uh, copied from the paper, the most recent paper, that most correct paper on this topic. And all of these are zero knowledge proofs. And of course, maybe some of them don't need full extraction and so forth, but it's very, very tricky to figure out whether this works in a concurrent setting or not. Um, how do you avoid this straight line extraction penalty? I've thought about that. 
If you are running threshold signatures just between devices, like for example, to keep your key for Ethereum or something like that, and these are devices you all hold and you don't think they'll be compromised, and you do that at, at home, then maybe you can serialize your executions and never run in a concurrent setting. But if you're using a company that runs a server that is holding half of your key, like many of the deployments, then this is an issue that has to be uh, basically dealt with. Okay, uh, now finally, the very last section, the really, really, really difficult issues uh, that I basically have no knowledge about. Okay, great. So the environment. When we write security proofs, especially UC proofs, we talk about this magic entity Z called the environment. And it gives us all the things here, the common knowledge of the participants of the protocol, common knowledge of the message, a session ID, as well as authenticated channels between all of the parties. And that's in fact, here is how we run our protocol when we uh, basically uh, benchmark it. And there you see the hand of God giving you all of this information about this particular protocol. And that's how we can benchmark this. But where does it come in real life? Where does this setup come in real life if uh, I've spent my time trying to deploy this and how do you basically get K devices to know about each other, common knowledge of each other and all the parameters of this particular protocol? Maybe with a QR code where one scans, right? But is that exactly the model because do all need to scan each other? Do you need N squared QR scans or N scans? It's, 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 uh, I don't have a good answer to this. Uh, um, okay. <clears throat> Other cases, growing a participant set. In the real world, you don't figure out T and N at the beginning of the whole world, you need to extend it. So you start with K out of K, maybe you wanna to go to K out of K plus one, add a device. How do you do that? Well, there are, that's actually not so hard. That's a pretty simple Shamir type of trick with uh, Lagrange, et cetera. Uh, how do you change the threshold? You start with K out of K, now you go to K plus one out of K plus one. How do you do that? You have to do a key refresh. And the biggest problem, when I started trying to implement an iPhone app and an Android app that does this, like basically all three of all these things, just they're very hard to do. Uh, when the parties aren't local, how exactly do you deal with this? When someone is requesting to join a particular set of keys, do you know this participant, you require them to be authenticated and log in with like Google or Apple first before you allow them to do a threshold key? It's a problem that I would love to get some advice on because I'm sure there's a smart person in this room that uh, knows more about it than me. Finally, this is something that also is devastating to me. So I set up a two out of two key, but then I lost my phone. But again, the instructions told me that I should, you know, basically back up or do something. And I was going to do a two out of three, but I lost my phone in the time between I set it up and right. Everybody understands this scenario. What do you do in this scenario? Every company that or every Every real world deployment has to deal with this and they have to deal with it in a way that doesn't lose the customer's wealth or data. And so you basically have to break the abstraction of the whole point of threshold crypto is to make sure that no single party has all the pieces. And this is a real problem. It's a real philosophical issue with this whole area. So again, I ask myself, is threshold, the idea of threshold signing a thing, is that 10x better improvement for a user or for an organization? What do you think? Come on, put your philosopher hat on, Nigel. Is it better? Is it 10x better or not? <laughs> so 2FA, my answer to this after thinking about this, 2FA is a real pain in the ass. If I have to log into Northeastern, I have to do this duo thing, or I've, you know, I basically, I, I, I'm late on all of my submissions because of this 2FA, but, so, <laughs> like my expense reports and stuff, but, so for me, it's a little bit of friction. For the organization, 2FA is basically a real game changer in terms of their operational security. So that's my same answer for this type of thing. I do think threshold uh, is, is useful, even though it's gonna put a lot of burden on people, uh, but it is going to help uh, some sort of operational, organizational, societal type of things. Um, for example, GitHub accidentally messed up their key, right? Everybody know about this? And, and if, if it was a threshold key, it might be better. Now, do we have threshold SSH? Uh, not yet, but why not? Uh, and maybe that pro prevents that one problem which caused a lot of developer friction, like one day of mess ups, right? For you know, two million developers is a, big is a big cost to society. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. Appreciate your attention. Sorry. And, uh... One, one question only, okay, so I'm sorry, hold on. So is the protocol 
basically mascot to produce beaver triples, then do the inversion. No, we don't standard. do. We don't use beaver triples. That is that is the clever thing. We don't ah. do it. We do use Bari Barilon, uh, the beaver Barilon inversion technique, oh. but we we don't use triples. That's why we avoid the overhead uh, from from your ST. But the, but the Mac is done because it's basically it's a signature in some sense. You don't need to. It's self-authenticating. Is that how it's self-authenticating? Yeah, that's yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right, for Gregory. Great talk. The stage is yours. Okay. Thanks again. To Abby. This is my daughter, Saber from the LLMs. Okay, the last talk in the session is about um, how a blockchain can keep many secrets. And uh, Gregory is the speaker. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is uh, work with my esteemed former colleagues, Andrea Trulli, Ashley Connolly, Francais van Price, and Victor Schoop at Affinity. I have just left Affinity, will be taking a new job at Chainlink Lab soon that I'm really looking forward to. But obviously, most of this work was done while, uh, while I was still at Affinity. Yeah. So, oh yeah, and by the way, there is going to be blockchain in this talk. Um, so, in case you haven't been following up on blo how blockchain has been evolving, it of course all started with Bitcoin and um, similar payment networks, um, whether or not named after a sort of animal. Um, they were doing mostly or just payments. Soon after that, um, Ethereum came up realizing that payments is actually restricted functionality and this could be generalized to small snippets of code called smart contracts that could usefully run in a decentralized replicated way across uh, the network, the nodes in the blockchain. Um, this code is somewhat limited, um, cycles on it are, are somewhat expensive. And so the modern blockchains have actually made different trade-offs in decentralization and have used new technology to make this much more, uh, much more performant so that instead of just like small snippets of code and, um, and small scripts, you can actually run full-blown web applications on these kind of networks. So these are called decentralized applications or dApps. Um, they find applications, uh, most famous are the finance applications, decentralized finance, DeFi. There's also social networks, SocialFi, games, online games, GameFi uh, that, are, that are starting to come up now. Now, when we're considering to move some of our Web 2 applications to a Web 3 um, atmosphere where things happen in a decentralized way, if you want to believe the marketing, then the great advantage is it's all secure by default. And in terms of integrity, availability, and censorship resistance, there is something to say for that. Like a single node cannot screw up what the code that is running, cannot fool you in giving you a view that is, that is not real, that is, not, um, uh, that is faked. Um, but in terms of confidentiality, we're actually taking a step backwards here. When in Web 2, all of your data would be resting in the, in the walled garden of a single service provider, in a Web 3 scenario, your data is actually sitting on a whole list of, of service providers and may even be sitting on a public blockchain that's publicly verifiable, but also publicly inspectable by that. So how would we want to improve the level of confidentiality of applications running in, uh, on a Web3 network um, uh, and, and make sure that we get a better deal out of it here? A common approach that often gets suggested is to have um, trusted execution platforms like Intel SGX or AMD SEV. Um, we've seen in a talk yesterday that security of those platforms is actually not so great. Um, they have a poor track record, especially against adver adversaries of physical access. In my personal opinion, these kind of platforms work well enough for working against the occasional opportunistic adversary, but a someone dedicated adversary will, will probably break that system. So it doesn't give you a lot of security. Another way of doing it would be every secret that you want to store in a block blockchain secret sharing it over the nodes in, um, in the blockchain. But if you have to do that for every single of your secrets, and it could be billions, trillions of those, whenever nodes join and leave the network, you have to do a resharing of those secrets in order to keep the secret alive. So that inefficiency is going to kill you for a large number of secrets. So that is, that is not, a, not a good option. You could take out the big guns, um, bring the best zero knowledge, multi-party computation or fully homomorphic encryption protocols that, that you do. Um, that works actually really well for, for small functionalities that are critical in security and have a, a limited scope of, of what they need to protect. For a general computation, the perform performance penalty for this will, um, will actually be too hard. 
Now, then of course, there's the option, why don't you let users manage their own encryption keys? And in, in, in a crowd that, that prides, prides itself on slogans like, not your key, not your crypto, you would think that user-side key management should be a solved problem. Now, the thing is, if you want to make this accessible to a wider audience and like the security that you want from YOLOing your life savings on a single cryptocurrency is probably different from if you want to use a social network, a social network on a Web3 network. So the security requirements are very different. And um, the problem is that those things that make life easier for authentication are not available for encryption. So hardware wallets and then specifically also uh, trusted hardware in user devices like phones, tablets and laptops make it actually much easier to do signature authentication on um, uh, on Web3 networks. For example, the small screenshot on the right there is the internet identity system of the internet computer, the blockchain produced by Definity. Um, there you don't see any crypto keys. Everything happens in the trusted elements in your um, Windows laptop, in your Mac, in your iPhone. Um, it, it works with all of that. You can just authenticate with, with fingerprint or face ID and, and you're logged in. That is great. The only thing is that those technologies typically do not support encryption keys. They only do signature keys. So for encryption, you, you actually cannot use this. The other way to do it would be storing crypto keys, encryption keys in browser storage. Now, the thing is you want these, of course, to survive the reboot of your computer. So you have to go into permanent storage of, um, of your browser, meaning they get written to the hard drive where they get more exposed to malware running on your machine. And if you ever want to delete cookies on your machine, this stuff also gets deleted. So you lose your keys. Not great uh, user experience. And in general, also managing multiple devices with, uh, with encryption keys, it just doesn't give for a great, great user experience. And so that's what this talk is going to be about, to essentially delegating that responsibility of managing your encryption keys, delegate, delegating it to the nodes of the blockchain. So what we're going to use here is a single master key managed by the nodes in the blockchain, secret shared among those nodes. And the dApps can deterministically derive strong cryptographic keys from that master key held by the nodes. And then users can actually use that derived key for symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, signatures will go into applications in a minute. Um, and those derived keys can not only be derived by the dApp so that the dApp can use it, but can also be derived in an encrypted form straight to the user so that only on the user side this key is visible and that none of the nodes in the network uh, or the dApp uh, that, they, that they get to see the key. So given that this is a rather cryptographic audience here that, I, that I'm speaking for, the easiest way to uh, explain how to get to this is starting from identity-based encryption. Most of you will be familiar with the concept. So you have a trusted authority on the right who has a master key pair, master public key and a master secret key. And Alice, when she wants to encrypt a message to Bob, she can do that using just the master public key of the authority and Bob's identity. And Bob, of course, needs to have some sort of secret that allows him to decrypt. This secret is a decryption key for his identity, Bob, that he can obtain from this, um, from this trusted authority. Now, if you want to deploy this in practice, then probably you're going to put some sort of instance in the middle there who actually verifies that Bob is the, the, the identity that he, that, that he claims to be, some sort of vetting system. And what you would probably do, it, excuse me, is setting something up like um, the user would, uh, so Bob, would generate a transport key pair, send like a transport public key to that vet, a vetting system, and the vetter would like check, yes, you are indeed Bob, and then that, uh, that vetting authority would forward it on to the, uh, to the master authority and say like, okay, maybe you can deliver this uh, decryption key to Bob and encrypt it under this transport public key so that um, Bob can recover that. Now, I'm talking here about, of course, like Bob as an identity. Identity-based encryption is actually more flexible than, and than that. It's not just an identity of user. It could be an attribute, a role, an event that happens. So think of it in a, in a more, more broader sense. Um, now, if we look at this picture here, and you're a bit in a decentralized mindset, there's a couple of things that hurt your eyes here, right? Decentralized authorities. So the idea is, of course, can we replace that um, central authority that derives the keys with a network of nodes that secret share um, the, the master secret key? And can we then also replace that vetting authority, please, by someone who, um, in a more trusted way, uh, determines who gets access to which key? And that could actually be a DAP, a smart contract running on, on a blockchain, who gets to decide which user at which point gets, uh, gets access to which decryption key. And this is essentially the setting that verifiably encrypted threshold key derivation, or VETKD, uh, works in. So you have a decentralized set of nodes that perform a DKG in the first step, a distributed key generation to generate a master key pair. 
A user who wants to derive a VET key, as we call it, uh, will first generate a transport key pair, send an, uh, an authenticated message, a transaction with a transport public key to the uh, DAP that is uh, distributing the keys. The DAP will, ev will evaluate which key should I be deriving for this user and uh, make a query to the network of nodes. This could be like a system call on, on the blockchain saying, I want to derive a VET key for this identity encrypted under this transport public key. The nodes perform a little protocol that consists of each node will first generate an um, encrypted key share, which is um, what it says. It's a share of it's a share of an encrypted key. Um, these shares can be verified. They will be verified. Uh, sorry, they will be broadcast to the other nodes and can be verified by the other nodes. Once a block, sorry, once a node has sufficiently many of these encrypted key shares, it can combine them into a combined encryption key, and that encryption key can then be included in a block on the blockchain as the approved response to the system call from the DAP. The DAP can then forward that encryption key to the user, and the user can recover the decryption key that um, that's, that he was was looking for. So this is how you would implement this sort of VETKD system in, um, in 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 a blockchain scenario. Now, um, if we're talking about VETKD for the Bonnet Franklin IBE, which will be the main focus of the schemes that, uh, that we'll be looking at, as you may know, the uh, key structure of the Bonnet Franklin identity-based encryption scheme are BLS signatures. So essentially what we're looking at is essentially like a, a VET way of deriving BLS signatures. Um, I have much cooler co-authors than, than I am who can turn this into memes. So whenever I'm talking about VETKD, what is actually um, happening underneath is, um, is threshold BLS. Um, credit to Ashling for creating that one. Um, Yes, yeah, so before we get into the schemes, let me tell you a bit about the use cases that you would actually be able to solve with this. So a very simple example would be end-to-end uh, -end encrypted storage hosted on a blockchain. So suppose that the DAP is like a storage DAP and Alice here wants to um, encrypt her files stored on the blockchain. What she would do is send an authenticated transaction using a, a containing a transport public key to the DAP. The DAP will then uh, derive uh, Alice's key, but in an encrypted way under this transport public key. So none of the nodes actually sees Alice's key that comes out. That encrypted key will be decryptable by, uh, by Alice and that gives her her own key, this key A in the picture here. She can encrypt her file under that key and dump it on the blockchain where, where it then gets stored. If she wants to later recover that, um, uh, that, same, um, that same file, then she will generate a fresh transport public key, again, send a, a signed transaction to the blockchain, to the DAP, who will then say, oh yeah, here's your, do another VET key evaluation, and the same key will, will come out again. In a similar way, you can do end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. By the way, I'm, of course, simplifying the whole scenario of end-to-end -end encrypted anything. There's more, like if you want forward security, you'll need more uh, details being added. You all know more about that than I do. Uh, this is just like proof of concept. But so for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, um, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she could send an encrypted, sorry, a signed transaction containing a transport public key and telling the DAP, I want to talk to Bob. The DAP will then derive a key for the concatenation of Alice and Bob's identities and let Alice derive a key that is related to that, um, that concatenated identity. Um, Bob will then, then be able to get a, uh, an encrypted message under that uh, derived key from the DAP, that is the encrypted message, derive the same key by doing another call to the, to the DAP. The DAP does a system call to derive a VET key and, um, and that way Bob can decrypt the message. I'm thinking that you're starting to get the principle. In a similar way, you can actually extend this to do a whole decentralized end-to-end -end encrypted social network. So where every post is actually encrypted um, under an identity, IBE encrypted under an identity, that, um, that is like a unique identifier of that post. And the social network DAP can then uh, simply perform, like evaluate the access policy associated with that post to determine which user is allowed to derive a VET key for this post and therefore get visibility into this post. So if, if you can actually tell that the DAP is now becoming kind of like an executor of the access policy and just a router of ciphertext and never gets to see any plain text, but can enforce any policy that the, the user has, has set for, um, for his data. 
Another interesting application is a dead man switch. Um, this is something that could be useful for journalists, dissidents, whistleblowers. Um, so when you have a precious piece of information that actually could get you into trouble and you're even fearing for your life because of it, you could actually dump it onto a DAP that takes this kind of information and tell the DAP, um, so if I don't ping you within this amount of time, then please reveal this information either to the world or to this trusted other accomplice of mine. And you can do this with a VET key by encrypting the data under a VET key, for example, again, uh, for the identity Alice, and um, adding a policy and a timer to it. And so Alice will regularly send an authenticated ping saying, like, I'm still alive, I'm still alive, which resets the timer. But as soon as that, um, the, those pings are not coming anymore, at some point, the DAP will then automatically reveal the data either to the world or to uh, whoever Alice appointed as, uh, as the people who should, should be receiving this data. A slight twist on this idea is actually a pretty cool one as well. There's a project called ICCrypt uh, that's actually building this or planning to build this on the internet computer for digital inheritance. If you want your social network passwords or whatever digital information, especially cryptocurrency keys to be passed on to, um, to your loved ones uh, once, once your time has come, you can actually use this as a sort of digital will. The secrets are uh, threshold kept by the network and will only be revealed to the, to the users of your choice after those pings stop coming in. Um, another cool application, I'm not sure whether you have heard of minor extracted value, MEV. This is a problem on, uh, on Ethereum and other networks where essentially um, the nodes are doing front running on any transactions, big transactions being made in especially DeFi spaces, um, taking, uh, taking advantage of the price fluctuations from a big transaction that they see coming in. Now this is actually a reasonably sized problem because of around $600 million have already been lost um, since 2020 to these kind of attacks. The problem is that these transactions are visible before they get executed. With these VET keys, you could actually have users submit the, their transactions in encrypted form, uh, for example, encrypted under the identity that is a time slot identity of uh, the time slot where they are uh, aiming for to get uh, included. All users submit their encrypted transactions, the transactions get in encrypted form sequence, the order gets committed to, and only then when the time slot happens, the DAP will actually proceed to decrypt, to derive the VET key for, uh, for that time slot, and decrypt all of the transactions and execute them in the order that was committed to in encrypted form. Similar way you can do secret bid auctions, um, so that would be a, a similar approach. There's more. Um, there's time lock encryption that you can do. I'm not going to go much into that. The next talk after the break will actually uh, go more into detail about that. Witness encryption, a sort of cryptographic tool where you can encrypt to a language member and you can only decrypt if you have a witness to that. If you have a DAP that actually checks witnesses, you can easily implement that with VET keys. It's a bit theoretic, but if you think of it, essentially what it allows you to use, you can encrypt to any event that can be observed by the DAP and let the DAP take care of observing the event and allowing access to decryption to those selected users whenever it happens. One-time programs, another cryptographic gadget that can be only evaluated once on, on one single input. You can dump a garbled circuit with uh, wire keys that are actually VAT keys um, and let the DAP only evaluate a single bit for, um, for every wire so that it can only be evaluated on a single input. You would almost forget with all of that that those VAT keys are actually BLS signatures, so actually can also be used as signatures, signatures in name of the blockchain, which can then be used to verify information stored on a blockchain in more efficient form on other blockchains, which gives you efficient cross-chain bridging. So with this fairly simple interface, you're actually in enabling a whole realm of, of, uh, of other applications, and all of that by sharing just a single secret shared key on, on that network, network uh, of, the, of nodes. Um, let me say a bit about the schemes that, um, that we're looking at. We, uh, we actually we have an upcoming paper that will be available on ePrint soon that um, uh, there's four schemes. There's a simple scheme where um, every node simply encrypts a BLS signature share to the transport public key of the user and the encrypted key is just a concatenation of sufficiently many, which is two T minus one because T minus one of them could be bad. Um, that is a simple scheme, but you can only use it if T is smaller than N and half um, because you need to cover for the, the bad guys. There's a slightly better scheme where the, uh, every node has to prove in zero knowledge that the encrypted share is correctly encrypted. To do that, you do Algamal encryption of the share in G1, which works because um, there you have by the external Diffie-Hellman security. 
um, but then still your encrypted key will be a concatenation of those zero knowledge proofs to keep it verifiable because those cannot be aggregated. You would expect better from BLS style signatures and of course you can. We have two versions of aggregatable schemes. Um, this is already the second one. Um, this is essentially the um, threshold version of the verifiably encrypted signature scheme that was already in the BGLS 2004 paper on aggregated signatures. Um, just taking to uh, an asymmetric pairing setting instead of symmetric, and there's two different ways of doing that. That's why there's uh, two variants of, of the scheme here. Without going into the details, um, so to integrate this onto the internet computer, I would have wished that this talk would have been more real world than it is right now, and just um, because I was hoping that we would have an implementation ready. It is not. That is how software engineering works. Priority chain, priorities change and uh, uh, developing software takes time. So just something that I want to uh, give on to, pass on to you. So the internet computer developed by Definity has different subnets. The plan is to in integrate at least one of those subnets with a key that is secret shared on it. Because the subnets can talk to each other, that would be enough to enable, enable all the dApps to have vet key access. One interesting thing is also that the internet computer is efficient enough to certify all of the assets stored on it. So also the JavaScript and WASM script that is downloaded into the user's browser. So it actually makes sense to to execute the client part of this in the browser because this part of the code is actually uh, threshold certified by a network of nodes rather than the, uh, depending on just the one node that you connect to. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these cool graphs that describe the performance of it and go straight to the conclusion of it. So keep your eyes open for the research paper that will be landing on ePrint soon. It has the detailed um, evaluation of, um, of the efficiency of it. Just roughly, um, this is a fairly simple interface that is efficient, uh, can be efficiently run. We're estimating that we should be able to do a hundred or a couple of hundred vet keys per second on, on a single network. Um, and uh, it opens up a whole spectrum of applications that were previously not usefully to be run on, on a Web3 scenario just because of the privacy issues with it. Um, there's also some upcoming work that um, I'm working on with uh, Michelle Abdallah from Definity that actually takes a second version of the aggregated scheme and turns it into a partially blind signature that gives, um, that gives access to a yet another list of applications, Untra un untraceable token transfers, uh, please use that one responsibly, um, anonymous credentials, oblivious transfers, uh, OPRF-like password strengthening, a whole list of other things, but I'm afraid I will have to keep those for another talk. Thank you. If you have a short question, you can do it. So when the validators of the subnet change, how does the, do you just do a key refresh? Yes, so um, in the internet computer that is already going on because it already uses threshold BLS, but indeed when the, when the nodes, um, when the network topology changes, you have to do a reshare of that secret key. Yeah. But now, don't you have this problem where like after a bunch of validators leave from validation, but they you know, basically have a party and then reconstruct their 2018. Once they get corrupted after they leave the network, then yes. they can- Yes, you need some forward security in that in order to, um, to, to cover for that, but yes, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, other questions will be made offline. So thanks, uh, Gregory, again. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, coffee break, and uh, we will gather at uh, 15.10.